In June of 1989, the world of superhero movies was forever changed by the release of Batman. The brainchild of director Tim Burton, this feature-length epic sought to revitalise the public's interest in the DC Comics hero, shaking off the 20-year hangover of the 1960s TV show and restoring Batman to his dark, mature and psychological roots. Upon its release, the film quickly became a cultural phenomenon. Not only did it break records for its first and second weekend box office and became the highest grossing superhero movie for the next 13 years, but it restored the Cape Crusader to the of mainstream popularity. There's a reason the phrase Batmania exists when discussing the original 1989 film. Burton brought Batman back to the forefront of popular culture and made him an absolute cornerstone of modern cinema. But the director didn't do it alone. The movie's unlikely star Michael Keaton played a major role in The Dark Knight's resurgence. Despite the initial backlash surrounding his casting, Keaton came to personify everything fans loved at the time about Batman. For entire generations, he's who they think of when they imagine DC's Dark Avenger. And even though countless other actors have donned the famous costume in years since, Michael Keaton has always remained a hugely significant and revered figure within the history of the Cape Crusader. However, while Keaton starred in two live-action Batman films, the 1989 original and its 1992 follow-up Batman Returns, before making an unexpected return in 2023's The Flash, there are actually numerous projects that would feature the actor as Batman that failed to see the light of day. From proposed sequels to Batman Returns, ambitious crossovers with other DC heroes, to a full-fledged return as part of the DCEU, the history of Keaton's unmade Batman films are genuinely fascinating. So in this video, I want to explain the history behind all of these cancelled Batman projects, discuss the history behind the actor's exit from the role following Batman Returns, and the original plans for the third instalment in Tim Burton's series, as well as the circumstances behind his unlikely return in 2023 and how The Flash almost paved the way for Michael Keaton to become the linchpin of an all-new cinematic DC universe. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. Tim Burton's Batman was a monumental success upon its June 1989 release, grossing over $400 million worldwide and setting numerous box office records. The film catapulted the DC Comics hero back to the heights of mainstream popularity. Batman's financial success and positive critic response meant that Warner Brothers were quick to develop a sequel, with Burton and Michael Keaton both set to return. Writer Sam Hamm was hired to pen the screenplay, and initially sought to focus the story around Harvey Dent, played by Billy Dee Williams in the original film, and his descent into becoming the villainous Two-Face. Warner Brothers, however, instructed Ham to feature the Penguin as the main antagonist instead, and as such, Ham's script for what became Batman Returns would see the Penguin, named Mr. Boneface, hire Selina Kyle, aka Catwoman, to steal five Raven statuettes from members of Gotham's criminal underworld. As Batman attempts to thwart their plan, we would also learn about the circumstances surrounding the murder of his parents, with Ham revealing that Jack Napier was hired to kill the Waynes after Thomas threatened to expose a conspiracy see at the heart of Gotham City. In addition, Vicky Vale was set to return as Bruce's love interest, and perhaps most notably, the screenplay also included a 13-year-old Dick Grayson, depicted as a solo vigilante protecting the city's homeless under the alias of Robin. Eventually, during the early stages of pre-production, Ham was replaced as screenwriter by Daniel Waters, with Burton favouring a writer with less attachment to the source material. Waters' script, later revised by Wesley Strick, was the one ultimately brought to life, as Batman Returns was released in June of 1992. 
Alongside newcomers Danny DeVito, Michelle Pfeiffer and Christopher Walken, Michael Keaton donned the cape and cowl once more in Returns, reportedly being paid $10 million to reprise his role as the Dark Knight. However, the response to the film was noticeably more mixed than the original. At the box office, it only grossed $266 million worldwide and received a far more polarizing reception from fans and critics. In particular, the movie's darker tone infamously resulted in a backlash from families and parental organizations, with McDonald's in particular receiving extensive criticism over their Happy Meal tie-ins. As such, while Batman Returns was still a financial success, Warner Brothers began to consider shifting the franchise into a more all-ages and family-friendly tone. Around this time, it became clear to Tim Burton that he wasn't going to be expected to return for a third film. As such, Burton transitioned into a producer role for the next Batman film, aiding the studio's search for its new director. After considering both John McTiernan and Sam Raimi, the studio hired Joel Schumacher in 1993, along with screenwriters Lee and Janet Scott Batchelor. The Bachelor's script was written with Keaton in mind to play the Cape Crusader once again, along with Rene Russo as new love interest Dr. Chase Meridian. The Bachelor's script followed the same structural beats as what evolved into Batman Forever, with the Riddler, named Lyle Heckendorf here, and Two-Face teaming up to fight Batman while Bruce Wayne would adopt Dick Grayson, eventually training him as his new sidekick, Robin. However, problems arose quickly as Michael Keaton was unhappy with this script. According to Entertainment Weekly, the actor was concerned about the more campy direction that the movie was set to go down, as well as Batman's lack of focus and an arc compared to the movie's villains. Keaton allegedly demanded a $15 million salary, as well as percentages on Batman Forever's box office and merchandise. And after several meetings with Joel Schumacher, Keaton's departure was eventually announced in July 1994 with Val Kilmer being swiftly announced as his replacement. Keaton's exit signified a noticeable breakaway from the Burton era films, with longtime composer Danny Elfman being replaced by Elliot Goldenthal, and actors Marlon Wayans, who was cast as Robin during the making of Batman Returns, Billy Dee Williams and Rene Russo, all being replaced with Chris O'Donnell, Tommy Lee Jones and Nicole Kidman. And even though Batman Forever can be considered a success, outgrossing its predecessor at the box office and signifying a more family-friendly tone, for the franchise, many longtime fans remain curious about what might have been if Michael Keaton had remained on board for one more Batman film. In August 2021, we got our closest glimpse into what this would have been like, as original Batman screenwriter Sam Hamm penned a six-issue comic book series entitled Batman 89. This series, drawn by Joe Quinones, acts as an unofficial sequel to Batman Returns, exploring aspects of the Batman mythology that both Hamm and Burton sought to dive into in the initial two films, as well as ideas that they'd considered for potential sequels. Specifically, the comic details Harvey Dent's downfall and transformation into Two-Face, alongside the introduction of Robin as Batman's crime-fighting partner. Interestingly, Ham first proposed the idea of a comic book continuation of Burton's story back in 2016, proposing alongside Quinones and Kate Leth, a series that would have introduced Robin and Two-Face, as well as Batgirl, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn. Although Batman 89 offered fans their best look into what a third Batman movie from Burton and Keaton would have been like, in reality, the franchise descended into camp and self-parody following the pair's departure. Batman Forever was followed up on by the ill-fated Batman and Robin in 1997, and its failure meant that not only would Batman be away from the big screen for eight years, but the notion of ever seeing Keaton don the iconic costume again became unthinkable. But as the 1990s drew to a close, an unexpected opportunity arose that could have seen the actor come back for one last time as the Dark Knight, as Tim Burton was hired to direct a new Superman film that would go on to become perhaps the most ambitious superhero movie never made. Batman Forever was a clear attempt by Warner Brothers to course correct the Batman franchise, distancing themselves from the overly dark stylings of Tim Burton and taking it into a more campy and toyetic tone under new director Joel Schumacher. Although Michael Keaton was a casualty of this change, Batman Forever did help stabilize the series at the box office, grossing $336 million worldwide, despite critics being overall divided on the new direction of the franchise. 
However, as Warner Brothers quickly pushed a fourth film into development, the studio would reunite with Burton for another ambitious superhero project. You see, while Burton had successfully brought Batman back to the big screen, his DC contemporary Superman had been away from cinemas for nearly a decade, following the failure of Superman IV The Quest for Peace. Despite early attempts to produce a fifth film with actor Christopher Reeve, Warner Brothers, who had regained the film rights to the hero in 1993, had enlisted producer John Peters to develop a brand new Superman reboot. And after initially entertaining scripts from Jonathan Lemkin and Gregory Poirier, Peters was approached by Kevin Smith in 1996. Smith pitched a film called Superman Lives, which would adapt the recent Death and Return of Superman comic and see the Man of Tomorrow face off against Doomsday, before battling Brainiac and Lex Luthor. Impressed by Smith's pitch, Peters hired him to write a full screenplay for the film, while also courting Tim Burton to direct it. As covered in the expert documentary, The Death of Superman Lives What Happened, this project underwent a troubled development process before its eventual cancellation in 1998. But initially, Burton was keen to bring the last son of Krypton back to the big screen, hiring Wesley Strick to rework Smith's screenplay and even casting Nicolas Cage in the titular role. An interesting wrinkle of Smith's original treatment, though, was that during Superman's funeral following his clash with Doomsday, Batman was set to appear and deliver a speech to the people of Metropolis. This scene can be found in the script that leaked online several years ago, written by Smith and dated January 31st, 1997. Here, we see a crowd of people surrounding Superman's tomb, including Lois Lane, as they mourn the slain hero, before Batman appears on a screen and says the following. Good evening, Metropolis. It is with a heavy heart that I offer you my and Gotham's deepest condolences. The guardian of your city, of the world, held Metropolis and its inhabitants very near to his heart. It's been said that he fought a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But to say that belittles the man, for he fought not just for our nation, but for the world. A world that was never truly his. Honor him well by keeping his memory alive in the face of this adversity. From this day forward, we forever shoulder the burden of a world without a Superman. Interestingly, while this script was written at the same time as Batman and Robin's production, a movie which saw George Clooney take over from Kilmer as the titular hero, this scene wasn't intended to be a crossover with the current day Batman and Cage's Superman. Instead, Smith has admitted that he wrote this sequence with Michael Keaton in mind, and many hoped that Burton could convince his longtime collaborator to return for this brief appearance as the Cape Crusader. Keaton would even publicly acknowledge the rumours of his return, though he remained coy on the specifics of his involvement with Superman Lives. Unfortunately, this shock return for Michael Keaton never materialised. Following a difficult pre-production, which saw three different screenwriters work on the film and concerns over its spiralling budget, Superman Lives was put on indefinite hold in April 1998. Tim Burton exited the project soon after, frustrated by creative differences with producer John Peters. Nevertheless, for a brief time in 1997, the possibility existed that not only could Michael Keaton return as Batman after a six-year hiatus, but he would do so alongside a brand new Superman, potentially ushering in a shared cinematic universe of DC heroes decades before such a thing would be attempted. If Superman Lives had been made, and had Keaton's cameo made it into the film, the landscape of DC, Batman, and superhero movies as a whole would be wildly different, and it's interesting to imagine what might have been if this iconic Batman would have made an unexpected return to help usher in an ambitious, interconnected universe. In the 20 years since Michael Keaton hung up the cape and cowl, Batman remained one of the most popular superheroes in the entire world. Despite the initial stumblings of Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, the hero's popularity was revitalised by Christopher Nolan and his Dark Knight trilogy. Following the release of The Dark Knight Rises, though, DC began to plan their next on-screen version of The Cape Crusader, with this Batman being part of a shared cinematic universe with other superheroes. 2013's Man of Steel was the first movie in this franchise, commonly referred to as the DC Extended Universe, and its 2016 follow-up, Batman v Superman, introduced Ben Affleck as the latest version of Bruce Wayne. Affleck would go on to play Batman in 2017's Justice League, a film mired by behind-the-scenes drama, and it was these experiences that led to the actor seeking to step away from the role. 
With Affleck seemingly out, Warner Brothers began to consider ways of recasting The Dark Knight, and these conversations occurred during the development of a solo film for The Flash. With this movie set to adapt the universe-hopping comic series Flashpoint, Warner Brothers executives devised a plan to bring back a former Batman actor after many years away. In June of 2020, The Hollywood Reporter announced that Michael Keaton was in talks to return for the film. News of Keaton's casting shocked the entertainment world, especially as the report stated that the actor was going to appear in several upcoming DC movies. Released in June of 2023, The Flash would mark Keaton's return to the DC Universe after after a 21-year hiatus, starring as an older, now retired Batman who aids Barry Allen in a quest to prevent an alien invasion and return the Scarlet Speedster home. While Keaton's role in The Flash now appears to be a one-and-done appearance, the original plan for this film was for Barry to change the DC continuity in his attempts to rewrite the past, and as such, Keaton would replace Ben Affleck as the main universe's Batman. The Flash's original ending would even reveal this, with Barry returning home and encountering Bruce Wayne, but discovering it to be Keaton instead of Affleck. With Michael Keaton now a part of the DC Extended Universe, he was set to appear in multiple follow-up films, even shooting scenes for several of these projects, with perhaps the most notable being Batgirl. After first hiring Joss Whedon to develop a Batgirl film in 2016, Christina Hodgson, the writer of The Flash and Birds of Prey, was tasked with penning the screenplay in April 2018. In 2021, the project gained directors Adil Al Arbi and Bilal Fala and was announced to be released exclusively on Warner Brothers' new streaming service, HBO Max. Soon after, Leslie Grace was cast as Barbara Gordon, J.K. Simmons was confirmed to reprise his role as Commissioner Gordon, and Brendan Fraser was cast as the villain Firefly. Then in December, it was announced that Keaton would appear as Batman, and that this film would introduce the hero's new status quo in the aftermath of The Flash. Although Keaton would only appear in a handful of scenes, his role as a mentor and an inspiration for Batgirl would be a significant aspect of this movie. Unfortunately, things took a shocking turn in August of 2022. You see, following Warner Brothers' merger with Discovery, the studio announced that the entire Batgirl film had been scrapped, despite principal photography being completed months earlier. This decision, made by new CEO David Zaslav, was done due to Warner Brothers' restructuring of their HBO Max streaming service, as well as a mandate of DC movies now only being theatrically released. Alongside his appearance in Batgirl, Keaton was also set to cameo in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. However, due to The Flash being delayed and Aquaman's release date being moved up, director James Wan later reshot this scene with Ben Affleck, as it would now take place prior to the events of The Flash. Most interestingly though, following Batgirl's cancellation, rumours surfaced that Christina Hodgson had already been working on a follow-up film for Keaton's Batman. Reports stated that Hodgson was working on an adaptation of the beloved animated series Batman Beyond. However, this project was scrapped following James Gunn and Peter Safran's appointments as the heads of DC Studios. Little is known about Hodgson's script or just how far into development this project got. However, rumours state that it would have focused on the romance between Michael Keaton's Batman and a version of Catwoman, potentially with Michelle Pfeiffer reprising her role from Batman Returns. Gunn and Safran's hiring would ultimately spell the end of Keaton's potential return. Not only was this proposed Batman Beyond film scrapped, but the entire plan of him crossing over into the DCEU was cancelled altogether. After the duo unveiled their plans for a new rebooted DC Universe, announcing a new Batman and Robin film that would feature different actors in the roles, a new ending for The Flash was filmed, removing the reveal that Keaton had been brought over into the main DC Universe. While the actor still remained a significant part of The Flash film, its final cut does not indicate that Keaton will return as Batman in any form, and instead is presented as his final outing as the Cape Crusader. Nevertheless, it's clear that over the past four decades, Michael Keaton has remained an integral part of Batman's cultural mythos. As the actor who brought the character back to the big screen, his impact can't be understated. Both Batman 89 and Batman Returns are massively significant in the history of The Dark Knight. Without them, it's unlikely the films of Bale, Affleck and Pattinson would even exist, never mind the overall impact that these movies have had on superheroes becoming an integral part of modern-day Hollywood.
But while Keaton's influence on Batman's legacy can't be questioned, I do often wonder how different things would have turned out had he remained in the cape and cowl for Batman Forever, or had these plans for him in the DC Extended Universe actually materialised. These questions of what could have been might now never be answered, especially now as Batman prepares for yet another live action reboot. Even still though, I think it's worth reflecting on the impact that Keaton had on the landscape of The Dark Knight, and consider how these unmade Batman films would not only have changed the fate of Gotham's Dark Avenger, but the entire landscape of superhero films. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on this video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video, I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this and you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that I think you might also enjoy. If you want to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so over at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Or if you just want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully I will see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.